Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again it's my great honour to introduce another of our eminent visitors to this country, uh, in this case Dr Anna Maria Steuben from uh, La Católica University in Chile. Uh, I'll introduce her in a moment. Uh, properly and a bit more fully, but before I do that, I'd like to invite the Ambassador of Chile, His Excellency Pedro Pablo Diaz, to say a few words. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here thanking all of you, all of you, my colleagues from the Diplomatic Corps. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, John, thank you very much. And in behalf of the Embassy of Chile, thank you for hosting us in this um, nice conference that Ana Maria is going to deliver. I know her some years ago. I met her only in the 60s. Don't say that. <laughs> and I didn't remember exactly the year, so yesterday night, he shared with me some pictures. And I remember when I met her. And we have something very important in common. Because I met her in February 1969 in New York, Manhattan, in Park Avenue with the 86 in a corner. <laughs> Where living under the same roof because the president of Chile today was living there with his father. And the Jose Piñera, the father of the president, was the ambassador of Chile in the United Nations. And we were friends of Sebastián, our president. And what we have in common is not only being friend of the president of Chile, because we were selling Coca-Cola. <laughs> we were working in Alps, a restaurant, um, earning some money to go back home again. And uh, we were the, uh, working in, in downtown New York, selling Coca-Cola. ¿Y cómo se llama la otra? Root beer. And root beer. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. And um, John, you have the call. Thanks very much, Ambassador. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Embassy of Chile for helping us with this meeting, uh, obviously with supplying us with our eminent speaker tonight, but also with the refreshments that will follow. And we invite you all to stay and continue the discussion, the conversation uh, after the meeting. But uh, let me first of all introduce Dr. Ana Maria Steuben. She's a professor at uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and director of the History of Political Ideas program at Universidad Port uh, Diego Portales. She has a PhD in history from Stanford and she is uh, an eminent uh, internationally known scholar, well published particularly in the field of political ideas and the history of women in Chile. It's, uh, and I was talking to you very briefly before uh, the meeting, that it's interesting for those of you, for example, who saw the interview between Julia Gillard and Anne Summers, uh, which took place at the, the Opera House last night. There is immense interest in the role of women in politics in Australia, obviously, and uh, there have been questions raised, many questions raised, about the kinds of the difficulties that women face in political life and more broadly in, uh, in society still, even after much progress has been made. So it's uh, particularly apt, I think, that we have Professor Steuben here to speak about this, this topic tonight. And would you please welcome her to the podium. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. John Minns, Director of the Center for Latin American Studies, UNCLAS of uh, Australian National University, members of the Diplomatic Corps, friends, colleagues, his Excellency, the Ambassador of Chile, to whom I thank for letting you know my age by now, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and part of our personal history, which was a very nice one. 
And of course, uh, Mrs. Diaz, his wife, our friend, my friend. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be today here. I thank you very much for your patience, and I hope that uh, you will not get very bored at what I will have to say. And of course, uh, after I speak, if there are any questions, comments, critiques uh, to what I've said, I would be very thankful to listen to them. I will start with uh, some general information about the history of Chile in order to be able to situate the role of women and the history of women as well as the contemporary situation of women in my country. 1808, as we were talking with the ambassador this morning, was a crucial year for America and the modern world. The invasion of the Iberian Peninsula by Napoleon's army unfolded a process of unexpected <coughs> consequences for the Atlantic world. The abdication by Ferdinand VII in favor of the French invader and the decision of the Spanish courts to roll back the sovereignty of the king to the people prompted the leading groups in the territories belonging to the crown to assume government in representation of the captive king. It is well known that when he intended to reestablish absolutism in Spain and its colonies, the Criollo population fought and for and declared independence. Excuse me for taking this quick reference to very basic data, often neglected when explaining the particularities of South American political processes and its permanent struggle with democracy. The point is that the Republican political system was not the result of a deliberation, but of the necessity to replace a rejected political system with the only viable alternative, monarchy by republicanism, the consequence being that from a social and cultural point of view, the local elites were not at all familiar with the requirements of a republic, nor anxious to live according to the dictates of the principles resulting from the transfer of sovereignty from the monarch to the people. Representation, citizenship, suffrage, all those concepts that are so familiar to us today were only some of the institutions that had to replace the divine right of the king and his fueros or concessions. The concept of rights added to the principles of equality and liberty transformed the Republican political scenario in a way unexpected for the by the elites for whom the protection of the king, legitimated by the will of God, was a guarantee against the possible pressures for participation by a people considered uncivilized and ill-prepared for participation. Therefore, my first point is that independence from Spain was an incredible intellectual surprise. Becoming a republic was a historical necessity the only possible legitimate political solution to the problem of authority, which undoubtedly created what François Furet has called an empty space, a void in the pyramidal structure of a corporate society where the king represented the head of the body politic. Among the cultural consequences of this void for the new ruling classes was a feeling of orphanage and thus a fear for anarchy the need to create individual nations from the remains of the large Spanish nation emerging only from historical identifications with the territory, but not from a consciousness of Chileanity, Peruvianity, sorry for the, for the neologisms. The new Republican state with uncertain limits, uncertain institutionalities, and uncertain people became the reality for those having to build, for example, the Chilean national state. Their definition of republic did not necessarily comply with liberal republicanism nor with liberalism, as we have probably read in the, history, in the traditional history books of our continent. It was a form of republic in which liberty did not take the form of an individual right, and in which liberty and equality were circumscribed by a more traditional view of the common good. Modernity with the priority given to the individual, was to be achieved in time, for which the ideology of progress, as stipulated, for example, by Condorcet, gave the perfect framework. This allowed to postpone the updating of the requirements for a representative government and a democratic society. It also allowed for a concept of time 
defined as in transit to progress, thus reducing the anxiety provoked by the theoretical demands of republicanism. History, with a capital H, as Reinhard Koselleck defines it, was oriented towards the future, the present being a time for experiments and not necessarily a time for the implementation of republican requirements. In this scenario, the first decades of independence, the Republic of Chile was established in 1818, even though in 1810 was first established the first government junta in representation of the captive king, witnessed different political experiments in the building process of the Republic, consistent with the fears of the people by the ruling class, but at the same time admitting that they had to create forms of political authority and representation corresponding to a Republic. The recognition of Catholicism as the only religion allowed for the moral and moderating influence of the church to maintain its credibility and support of a social order with certain divine sanction, despite the early emergence of conflict with the clergy for the inheritance of the rights of patronage formerly associated with the monarch. In this context, republicanism, Catholicism, and social order became the leading consensual values, which in the case of Chile, suffered less violent challenges from dissident groups than in other countries of South America. Nonetheless, the elites were fearful of the anarchical times that other Latin American countries were going through at the time, and from Bolivar on, realized that establishing democracy in the continent was, as Bolivar said, like plowing in the sea. In order to build the new republican order, social order, understood as institutional instability, the absence of social unrest and of threatens to the power structure imposed by the dominant group should prevail, even at the cost of the interruption of constitutional rule. The ruling class believed that a shared belief, faith in its consequent shared view of the world was not only good for those who truly believed, but an instrument of social order and control as well. It was a protection faith against the inevitable influence of intellectual and political ideas and processes over the value matrix of society. A society where rationality took the place of the providence as a guide was conceived as dangerous, especially in a situation of no confidence on the people as capable of exercising popular sovereignty nor of enjoying citizenship. Thus was established a separation between civil society and political society civil rights and political rights, and, borrowing from Rousseau, a rational will and a national will. Rationality and civilization were the requirements for membership into the political society. Within this very general context, let me now introduce women as part of the deliberation between inclusion and exclusion into the public and political spheres, as defined by Jürgen Habermas, as characteristic of a modern world where the individual replaces the community as the privileged reference for political deliberation. Regarding the Republican demands, very early in 1812, José Miguel Carrera criticized the neglect of women by colonial authorities and ordered that every convent open a section for the education of women in the chores corresponding to her nature, that is, religion, to read and write, sewing, embroidery, and just a little of arithmetic, everything oriented towards the education of the children and the promotion of religious and moral values. This is the first consideration towards the education of what was called the weak sex, in what constitutes for us, in its development in the following decades, a focal point to observe how its contents and the opportunities awarded to women reflected the conflicting views of a traditional society facing the challenges of the modern world. Discussion about her nature, including her body, and particularly her brain, were fundamental to, to define each group's standing on the social role of women and their insertion into the public sphere or their admission into public opinion. For both sexes, the Republican state put a special emphasis on education as an element of civilization and a requirement for the insertion into the world of citizenship, where Chile was a leading country during the 19th century. Elite women were educated in private schools, and until the struggle between the church and state in the 1840s became evident, 
It was the state and not the church which emphasized education for women. I shall return to this in a moment. My hypothesis is that though neglected in terms of their rights, especially political, elite women were a key instrument both for liberals and conservatives in the project that each had for the nation to be created, being both groups the representatives of the political divisions within the consensual social identification of the ruling class. In that sense, the topic about the insertion of women in the public sphere is about Republican demands of inclusion, but also about power and Republican political parties. From the 1840s, when the co-optation of women became relevant for both the Catholic Church and the state in their dispute over the control of the political institutions and the consciousness of the newborn nation, women obtained recognition of their power within the spheres that pertain to them, the home and the education of the children. And the church invited foreign congregations of nuns to educate elite women. That is, feminine power would find its place in women's performance of their function within the family. And this is a contribution of the gender studies which allow us to see women where they effectively acted and not where they were absent during, the history, during history. The church would also add the defense of the faith. I argue, therefore, that although direct female participation in political society was not raised as an alternative, just as other minors were not considered e either, aborigines, etc., women increasingly became a key element of civil society. Thus, by the mid of the 19th century, with women's public participation in defense of the church, the rigid separation between public and private began to blur, and women assumed a prominent role in both the public and the private imagination. As Erika Massa rightly points out, they exerted a sort of Catholic feminism. Let me illustrate this point, which may sound very uh, surprising to you. As early as 1844, there was a debate in which an important journalist in Chile wrote that women should be educated in reason and enlightenment. So she could occupy the position to which she was destined by nature. This position included the defense of the faith, so she should be able to rid herself of what he said, of what he called the errors taught to her by fanatics, and transmit the spirit of the gospel, being it that, and I cite, God made women free, and she is a slave by the influence of men. In order to overcome this imposition, women needed scientific education as opposed to church one. The Revista Católica, founded in the 1840s to fight the equivocal ideas of the century, responded by defending church education and attacking philosophy and rationalism as anti-religious. Furthermore, the Revista argued that scientific knowledge was not necessary for accomplishing the moral and domestic obligations of a mother. This is just to say that this kind of polemic suggested that behind the struggle for or against scientific education for women, there was a recognition of their place of power, which justified that so many men made representations of her intellectual, biological, genetic, psychological, and spiritual constraints and strengths. In 1856, on occasion of a conflict between the Archbishop of Santiago and the government on matters related to church and state jurisdiction, elite women challenged the President of the Republic that they would not allow any retaliation against the clergy, not only because of their courage, but in part because of it, negotiations prevented a larger rupture. That is, women influenced in, in how to solve this problem between both jurisdictions, state and church. Years later, women published a periodical called El Eco de las Señoras de Santiago, the Echo of Santiago's Ladies, appeared in 1865 on the occasion of the discussion in Congress of the possibility to abolish Article 5th of the Constitution, which established the exclusiveness of the public practice of Catholic religion. Remember that the state in Chile, was, as in most Latin American countries, was constitutionally Catholic. The periodical was supposedly written by women to prevent the passing of the liberal project, 
but historians like the liberal Benjamin Vicuña Maquena denounce the presence of their husbands in their writing. A newspaper of the time wrote that women were not capable of arguing in such a way. They didn't have that sort of arguments in their minds. Let me add that my sources indicate that during the 19th century, women on their part did not intend to get involved in other matters than those related to family and religion, not only in Chile, but elsewhere in the Western world as well. Only towards the end of the century did they exert pressure to further their access to education and follow similar curricula as men. The result in Chile was that in 1877 they were allowed to take exams valid to apply to the university, being the first in Latin America. The professions they chose in the beginning were all related to their cultural tradition of women's involvement, medicine, especially midwives, law, and areas dedicated to family and health matters. The University of Chile was the first in South America to graduate women. The situation of women tended towards further incorporation into civil rights, especially when faced with the need for regulation of their participation in the workforce. Traditionally, it is obvious, women did work as artisans or servants of all sorts with no access to gender considerations. By the turn of the century, when the conflict between church and state was solved with virtual separation, when education had rendered its roots and an active middle class supported by popular sectors demanded for labor laws, women founded their own associations, at first to improve their working conditions, soon to obtain rights for fair salaries and protection from abuses in the handling of the family income and the legal situation of the children. The process of incorporation of Chile into the capital era, as Hobsbawm describes it, was accelerated after the victory of Peru and Bolivia in the War of the Pacific between 1879 and 1884, which ended with Chilean troops in Lima and the addition of two provinces to its territory with rich copper mines and one of the best nitrate deposits in the world. While the north of Chile attracted workers and investors, agriculture suffered one of its cyclical crisis, crisis and the capital Santiago was invaded by former peasants. The 19th century, defined by the ideology of indefinite progress, was coming to an end, with the ruling class and the oligarchy having to face and smell the dirt of a city who hosted glorious palaces for the rich and slums for the poor. This process, labeled as the social question, had decisive social and political consequences in the first half of the 20th century, with enduring consequences during the second half of the 20th century. Charity, which had been the main occupation of well-to-do ladies, was soon overcome by the need for further solutions. Rerum Novarum, considered the first social encyclica by Pope Leo XIII, warned against the possibility of social unrest by socialism and also of injustice by liberalism. Discussed among some Catholic circles, it became an incentive for women to engage with the poor and the working force and also to open the minds of an hermetic oligarchy, which by the 20s and 30s started to use concepts such as social justice. As a consequence, members of the Conservative Party proposed the passing of laws for the protection of infants, combat against tuberculosis, and other so-called social illnesses, decent housing for workers, and promoted laws against the crime of usury. It is paradoxical that conservative women were most socially oriented than liberal ones. If this is due to the fact that since they were the ones involved in charity, were also closer witnesses to the social situation of the poor. At the same time, some elite women dared to challenge the cultural status quo. For example, Martina Barros translated The Slavery of Women by John Stuart Mill, risking what she later declared was the despise of her social circle. Stuart Mill had written that the best demonstration of social progress was the advance of equality between men and women. Martina also denounced the fact that society entrusted the children of the fatherland to women, but did not entrust them with the possibility to vote. In the 1920s, women's interest shifted from associations to protect their civil rights to the formation of women's political parties. 
Dipartido Femenino Progresista Nacional, Dipartido Cívico Femenino, Di Movimiento Pro Emancipación de la Mujer, and later the Partido Femenino de Chile, witness to the newly discovered political way to improve their condition. All of them published their own periodicals and offered alternatives for the advancement of women's position in society. Evidently, the rise of feminist movements in the US and other Latin American countries and the involvement of women professionals in international organizations after the First World War was decisive in the introduction of a discourse associated to the concept of rights for women and not concessions, and not only for concessions granted by the male world, nor by the state. Let me mention that Chilean women formed part of the Pan American Union in 1908. Four of them attended the first International Congress of Women in 1910, that they were incorporated in the International Women's Suffrage Alliance of Carrie Chapman of the States and that the Pan American Conference of Women was held in Santiago de Chile in 1923. In the 30s, a Chilean women, woman participated at the Conference on Nationalities of the League of Nations in The Hague and prepared a report on the situation of women for the Inter-American Committee of Women. This is just one of the major changes in the access of women to the public sphere. When Olympia de Gouges, during the French Revolution, dared to oppose the universal declaration of women's rights to that of the rights of men, her destiny was the guillotine. For almost one century, the concept of rights was never applied to women. Patriarchal societies, even liberalism, did not conceive of awarding other theoretical place for women than the domestic civil society in the distinction created by John Locke in the 17th century between political and civil society public and private spheres. Let us also recall that the Russian Revolution and the Marxist-Leninist parties in America did not struggle for women's rights, since they privileged class struggle rather than gender or race. By the 1920s, this position was definitely questioned in Chile, and one can find men, among them President Arturo Alessandri, attracting women towards politics and promising political rights to them. At the time, the mother-child diet became one of the most important claims for women. High rates of infant mortality, the need to protect maternity, and working rights all indicated the urgency to seriously discuss the legal situation of women. Divorce and voting were discussed. The law of divorce, of course, always, always rejected until very recent decades. Even though unsuccessfully, they were decisive in placing feminine problems in the political arena. The right to suffrage for women in Chile was granted first in 1934 in what was called pedagogical terms, only for local authorities. By 1949, they were granted full voting rights, and in 1952, women first voted in a presidential election. Let us mention that this right was granted rather late compared to other Latin American countries. Uruguay granted it in 1927, but earlier than Argentina and France. Australia, of course, was the first country to grant them in 1861. It is interesting to mention that despite the struggle of the 20s and 30s for rights, when suffrage was obtained, women did not continue acting corporately. They were incorporated into feminine sections of male political parties and demonstrated, as Maria de la Cruz, first women to sit in the Senate, said, parties mean nothing for the future of our democracy. This meaning, to my understanding, that even though women struggled to become full members of the polity as far as the recognition of their political rights is concerned, they did not believe that it meant great progress if not accompanied by cultural changes and gender considerations in a society that formerly modern continued with ancestral traces of traditionalism. The 60s and 70s were decades of great turmoil in my country, not only politically, but also culturally and socially. Politically, Marxism and polarization within the elites involved women. The Cold War and the fear of a world disintegrated by radical opponents to the Catholic pseudo-aristocratic ethos of an insular society were elements with which women did not remain indifferent. Governments were active in promoting women participation 
especially from a traditional perspective as mothers in the local level. They also access better levels of education. Between 1950 and 1973, date of the military coup led by Augusto Pinochet, 30 women were elected for Congress, similar to the participation of women in France, the US, and Great Britain, the difference being that most of them had some family tie with male politicians. In 1970, Salvador Allende inaugurated his experiment with socialism, Chilean style, with red wine and empanadas, as we shall share in a few moments. You all know the outcome of the experiment and the deep polarization of Chilean society at the time. Just as the socialists in the 20s, the Allende government did not intend to revert traditional roles for women and insisted that she above all be mother, overworker, or citizen. A study by Sandra Deutsch demonstrated that socialist men perceived themselves as the subject of revolution, while women were supposed to be secu seduced to second him. Allende himself declared that men should, and I cite him, conquer women for the revolution with passion and tenderness. But women in the opposition to Allende did not wait to be conquered. They rallied in the streets against the government which they perceived as threatening Chilean values. In fact, as the economic and political situation became critical, when markets emptied and the government proposed a law to control education, just as they had done to defend their church in the 19th century, women became protagonists in favor of family and property. The traditionalist ethos returned in all its strength, providing more than one of them arguments for the defeat of the socialist experiment. The military in Chile are, as in most places in the Western world, a traditional institution. During the 17 years of the military in power, there were only two women as cabinet members, from 15 women in Congress before to no Congress. The spirit of Pinochet towards women can be summarized in part of his message in 1974 to the Chilean Office of Women. And I cite him. A woman who becomes a mother doesn't expect any material goods. She expects and finds in her own son the goal of her life her only treasure, the realization of all her dreams. He himself promoted himself as an authoritarian father and encouraged his wife in her work with women feminine groups who were supposed to be part of his political constituency. The deep economic crisis in the first years of the regime forced popular women into activism when unemployment was above 18%. Women organized ollas comunes, community pans, for feeding the community. It was also inspired by the solidarity of spouses and mothers with the victims of human rights violations. They occupied public spaces and abandoned their domestic roles, challenging cultural stereotypes, and as elite women had done against Allende, rallying against the regime, 1983 was a crucial year for women. It was the year when protests became public and fearless when a group called Women for Life organized a multitudinary meeting at the Teatro Caupolicán. In 1986, women openly denounced the gender attitude of political parties. Women welcomed with great optimism the return of democracy in 1999, as did, of course, most of the country. They paid their price, though. When tensions eased, and the priority was that of consolidating a risky process of democratization, the demands of individual or marginal groups were subsumed into the larger process. The mystic and ethic justifications of women's struggles in a way lost their legitimation since a new political context reopened the institutional challenges, channels excuse me, of participation in the public arena. The rules of the political game were once again enacted and women had to face the historical problems for their political participation. Manuel Antonio Garreton, has demonstrated that the problem of, for women is not so much that of participation, since she enjoys and employs her rights. 93% of Chilean women were registered to vote when it was not automatic as it is now. And their participation in elections is similar to that of male population. The problem for political participation seems to be access to power and public office, related to two historical conditions of Chilean politics from my point of view. <clears throat> 
First, that women became interested in politics, as we mentioned, in the 20s and 30s, when political ideological divisions were already established in Chile between a right, a center, and the left, each with its political parties where women only had a chance to join in the spaces open to them. And second, because political parties, until the recent emergence of social autonomous groups or social movements, were the only intermediaries with the state. Only recently, as in most countries in the West, Associated with the decreasing credibility of political parties and institutions, groups representing social demands have substituted Congress and political parties by the public space, where supported by the means of communication, they socialize their demands and put pressure on institutions. In Chile, up until now, students have been the most active. Women are in the rear, especially because in the last years, important progress has been made notably in favor of maternity. You're probably now expecting me to recognize that having had the first woman as president in the history of the Republic, and today having two main candidates for the November election being women, is not a minor data. It is not minor either that the 20th century witnessed, as we have mentioned, important organizations of women, and that both Allende and Pinochet had to face dangerous opposition by women. Of course, as we have mentioned, political parties do not promote women participation unless they have certain profiles that either attract because they satisfy the aesthetic and personality codes of traditional groups or because exactly the contrary, they compete successfully with men in their own field. And let me advance maybe a rather crazy idea. Michelle Bachelet is on this election the perfect mother. When she was first candidate, her image was that of a strong woman. She was seen driving a tank when Minister of Defense. Evelyn Matei, on her part, is a strong, outspoken economist for whom being also attractive provides a surplus in the struggle within the male world. It is interesting that until the arrival of Mrs. Bachelet to La Moneda in 2006, the evolution of the participation of women in political decision had been slow but steady. From 1989 to date, the percentage of senator women has increased from 2.6 to 13.1%, and that of congresswomen from 5.8% to 14.2%. The average feminine participation in Congress is of 13.9 to date, low compared to the region, which is 22.3. The average, let me say, in OECD countries is 25%. Progress has also been oscillating. From 15.8 of Congress women in 2005, 2009 had 14.2. At the level of leading government executives, the Bachelet era offered almost half of the positions for women. Just to compare, after the recovery of democracy, pre the first president, President Delwin, nominated 5% of women in his cabinet. Frey, the follower, 16%. Lagos, 31%. And President Piñera, 18%. In elections, men occupy 80% of the positions as candidates for Congress. It is true also that women have not been interested or able of creating their own political leadership and have always been dependent on the support of political parties. In recent years, a new form of protagonism by women is appearing in the social milieu. It is the case of student leaders and labor unions. In fact, for the first time, Barbara Figueroa is the leader of the main labor union in the country, usually up until now and continuing now, in hands of the Communist Party. But these are exceptions or symptoms of an apparent integration, when in the anglo saxon world they call tokenism, contrasting with the underrepresentation in most stances of political decision. I think that another crucial factor to explain the lack of participation of women in the public sphere, not only in politics but in all areas, is that Chile continues to have, despite advances, a very traditional society in the sense that its cultural socialization and value system is not fully modern, as understood in the rest of the Western world. Let us recall that in Chile, the term public women 
woman is still a synonym to a prostitute, that most women who occupy public positions need to demonstrate that they are good mothers, not least good spouses. Elsa Chaney did an interesting research demonstrating that women participate in politics as mothers. And if we look recent advances in the situation of women, the most important one is the extension of the postnatal under the Piñera government that is a concession for mothers, probably taking into account also the fact that demographic statistics demonstrate a progressive decay in the fertility rate in the country. The average number of children is at somewhat less than two, mainly among the top 20% of the population according to income. Another traditional trait in Chilean society which influences the participation of women is the Catholic Church, which has not been exactly receptive to introducing women in decision areas, despite good news on the part of Pope Francis. The only encyclical written on women, Mulieres Dignitatem by John Paul II, insists on equal dignity between men and women, but states that maternity is a deeper reality in women and that their main concern should be the education of the children. Besides, as has already been said, the Catholic imprint was historically associated to the maintenance of social order and resistance against the moral and even political challenges posed by modernity. Francesca, another author, remarks that moral and social conservatism in the political class in Chile, the weakness, heterogeneity, and lack of integration of women's movements are important restraints for a higher degree of feminine participation. At this point, let me tell you something about what women themselves think, ourselves think. It is obvious that traditional society would not continue to exist if it did not have an important support by both sexes. That is obvious. An important yearly survey in Chile reached interesting conclusions about the value system of women in 2012 and their insertion in the public sphere, both in politics and in work. Regarding politics, Corporación Humanas in 2011 observed that women feel very discriminated in politics. 74% only surpassed by the working environment where it is 95%. This contrasts and probably causes great frustration because at the same time, their interest in participating in politics has increased in 12 points from 2009. Where one can observe most important changes in the value system of women is among the segments with higher income and higher education. Their tendency is to let go the domestic as well as the submission towards the husband as a natural condition and obligation for them. Most important, they distrust marriage as a source of happiness, accept living with unmarried couples in a higher proportion than men, and even bear children in this situation. In Chile, 69.5% of the children are born outside marriage. In 1970, it was only 30%. Women seem to be no longer willing to cope with an unsatisfactory relationship for the welfare of children, are adamant in defending the right to work, and as we mentioned, no longer wish a large family. Interesting enough, their answers demonstrate attitudes less conservative than their male counterparts, for whom obviously marriage is satisfactory in a cultural setting where male infidelity and male absence from the home receives little or no sanction. Men, keeping up with their machista bringing, demonstrate preference for being the only breadwinner in the family, supporting again what women reject, money as a source of power. Where women do not demonstrate important changes is in relation to raising children. They consider that they are more capable and necessary than men and also demonstrate further control and dedication to the well-being of the children. In popular sectors, there has been less change women have less opportunities to work, in part due to the difficulty of obtaining child care. Therefore, they provide less of the family income and thus depend more on their husbands. That is why they are more capable of coping with abuses and unhappiness in their marriages. Full insertion of women in the public sphere in Chile is far from guaranteed. Women of social sectors with access to economic well-being, 
higher education, information and contact with the outside world have evolved to value their freedom, appreciate work, and desire to participate in as much as they do not subordinate their maternal roles. The conservative ethos is still very predominant among groups with strict Catholic upbringing, where more fundamentalist devotions have an important constituency like the Opus Dei, Sodalicios, and Legionarios de Cristo. They tend to be the voting support for the right in the political spectrum. Attitude towards marriage is definitely one of the most important changes in educated women. If there has been an increase in the insertion of educated women in the public sphere, why are women thus still underrepresented? Only 2.9% of women are members of political organizations versus 4.9% of men. Regarding women in leading positions in the public sector, only 6% are women, 20% in labor unions. In the private sector, only 3% occupy positions as CEOs, while they represent 41.4% of the working force, salaries of men being approximately 35% higher than those of women. Wage gap is increasing, not decreasing, according to Comunidad Mujer. We have mentioned discrimination on the part of political parties and the prevalence of a conservative ethos reinforcing the domestic role of women inherited mostly from the Pinochet dictatorship. As far as political parties are concerned, for the next election to be held in November, of 548 candidates, only 18% of them are women, as has been in the last 20 years. This means that besides not accomplishing decentralization of decision making, means are not adequate to represent the complexity of society through adequate mechanisms, which is evident in the fact that Chilean population expresses little esteem for political parties. Identification with the two main coalitions descended from 70% in 1990 to 30% this year. Women have therefore not profited from other evidently modern traits in Chilean economy and society. Sexism, elitism, and classism are contradictory elements between a social reality open to change and the official institutionalized society. Gates for diversity still need to be opened. It is an uncovered need because inclusion into institutional and social organization allows for democracy to complete what has been a very long transition period. My opinion, and of course that of many analysts, is that one could revert the situation if Chile incorporated the system of quotas, at least transitorily, installed in Latin America in the last years. If the tendency is towards participation, one has to stress the need for affirmative actions. Contemporary democracies have appreciated the principles and values that socially legitimate them. It has demonstrated effective in increasing political participation for women, especially considering that 53% of the Chilean electorate are women. 50 countries in the world have assigned quotas, and 11 of them are in Latin America. According to Flaxo, in 2005, countries with quota system had increased feminine participation in the legislative from 9.5% in contrast to 2.5% in those who did not have quotas. The literature also shows that women representing specific feminine points of view become very influential with the quota system. An example of this inclusive convention has been offered recently by the European Union by establishing a quota for women of 40% in the administrative councils of private enterprises with participation in the stock market. If we take into account that before only 12% for, were women, that in 97% of the occasions the council was presided by a man, this norm will probably oblige enterprises to favor women. Those firms which do not represent the norm will pay a fine or other forms of sanction will apply. The figures I have shown, and with this I'm going to finish, are eloquent to the underrepresentation of women. Are we thus to be optimistic then? Undoubtedly, the chances for a woman president in the near future in Chile are very high. But once in power, women have not necessarily demonstrated further compromise with gender topics. As it was in the history of Chile, it still tends to be that women consider that power belongs to the male world, and thus 
should be exercised by women to obtain male approval. Nonetheless, the compromise with democracy may and should express itself in advances towards equality and foster the cultural changes necessary for the transit from a democratic government to a democratic society. That gender is obvious, that the private center requires to be forced into some form of affirmative action. Advancing towards gender parity through some form of affirmative action in public and the private sectors should become inescapable in a country with a democratizing agenda, as is the case of Chile. Thank you very much. We have recently made a study in, in the Catholic University interviewing women who left the university and who are still in the academic uh, field. In the, well, this study is only restricted to the Catholic University of Chile. Most women who quit the Catholic University of Chile do it because of uh, differences in, in, in the salaries mm -hmm. and because of discrimination in the process of integrating into the academic profession. Why? Because, and this is something that is tending to change very recently, there has been a debate in the country about this. The idea is that for women who are becoming mothers in the process of their academic career, which is normal, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the suggestion is that the time in which they are, uh, uh, they are pregnant or, or, uh, or feeding the child they so suspend the uh, demands for academic, uh, uh, for uh, in accomplishing the, 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 the goals set for all academics. We all have to publish, we have to teach, and we have to do research. No? The idea is that this should be uh, suspended in the time when women are uh, being mothers, because it is unfair to compete with male who, who, with the men who have the, the opportunity to work during the whole period. But that is far from being uh, consolidated by the time. A couple of things. First, that the, uh, that the recognition of gender as a possibility for uh, visualizing the role of women in the public sphere is something very important. Because uh, uh, when women's studies started, the idea was, and a historian has called it, to write her story, which means that since they have been neglected in history, now let's make them appear. And, but still, women had their own story, men had their own story. The, 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 the recognition of gender as a useful tool for political analysis, as John Scott uh, calls it, allows for the possibility of studies in which the integration of women and men can be considered as a possibility. And from that perspective, and understanding that studies always uh, influence uh, political practices, from that perspective, you can identify those knots huh, where real integration is not taking place. Uh, as I think I showed, uh, because of the, uh, of the upbringing of traditional women, political politics was not a goal. Women at first thought that they had nothing to win with politics because politics was a male world. That what they were interested was in civil rights. I mean, how to protect my child, how to get my divorce, how to get my husband to give me the money that he earned and not drink it anywhere else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now they understand because of, uh, of the advances with, uh, with the theory of gender, they understand that politics can be a realm where they can advance. And as I mentioned, I think that the idea of quotas in a very transitory uh, way, because I don't agree in quotas permanently. I think that uh, uh, establishing quotas as a permanent decision is a way of discriminating also. You can discriminate positively, and you can discriminate negatively. So I think that the possibility to discriminate positively for a short period of time in order to allow for all of these gender advances to really impose themselves into society will 
can make us think of a very uh, uh, positive future. I think that contraception is probably one, one of the important issues in allowing women to work, etc. But I don't think that social mobility depends on abortion nor uh, necessarily on contraception. Uh, social mobility in Chile is increasing a lot. Um, uh, there is uh, the, the, uh, the qualification of the uh, middle class is uh, increasing very much in, the, in the, uh, the surveys indicate that there is, I don't have the exact uh, numbers, but uh, through economic development, there is a, a strong possibility of social mobilization. Chile tends to be a rather inclusive society at this point. Uh, the discussion on abortion, as I said, is taking place. But personally, I don't see the direct relationship between abortion and social mobility. Chile tends to have a lot of social taboos. Chile tends to be a very elitist society, as I mentioned, a very sexy society. Uh, traits of machismo are permanently uh, uh, enacted in different fields. My point about your question is that I think that it should be competent with, it, it should be, uh, it should be, uh, uh, one should struggle against it in the cultural milieu very much, but I don't see exactly that abortion should be the field where it would be uh, most notably uh, overcome. I see that there are other fields when, uh, for example, uh, the, 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 the traditional upbringing, there is a, there is a, we tend to reproduce traditional upbringings in the family, and that is something that I think will have long-term consequences if that is in combated in school and in other areas. I don't see the direct relationship with abortion. I think that uh, indigenous women are completely uh, dependent on the advance of women in general. Huh? Uh, there are no discrimination laws against indigenous women in Chile enacted at all. So therefore, uh, from my point of view, the, what is really important is the integration of indigenous people. Hmm? And if you integrate indigenous people, you will integrate indigenous women. Uh, I think there is much that has to be done yet. Much that has to be done. Um, I think that uh, the, the, the conflicts that are now uh, uh, aroused by the indigenous populations have to be very uh, carefully studied because some of them are indigenous, are, are indigenous problems which the state should attack and one should uh, 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 very carefully uh, uh, study in order to integrate them. Uh, there are others which are political organizations utilizing uh, indigenous movements as their, their target, but not necessarily. Now, I fully agree with you that indigenous populations should be integrated, and that the integration of indigenous population will obviously have a consequence of women. Sure. Uh, I think it's uh, marriage and maternity that have a, a, a great uh, influence on the fact that women quit their studies, that, uh, that, uh, that women do not aspire to, to, to further their careers. I mean, there is a certain difficulty in, in the compatibility between uh, uh, traditional family chores and and studies. I mean, I myself did my PhD with two children, and of course, my situation was much harder than those than that of my male counterparts. Mm. So, uh, women tend to quit earlier yeah. in the in the career. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is that, at least in Chile, and I imagine here it is also that uh, women favor the social sciences mm. more than the scientific professions because. There are, the, I mean, the job opportunities in the social sciences, like, for example, teaching, is something that is, seems to be more gender uh, adequate for women. There are many points in your question which are interesting in the case of Chile. One, uh, that uh, the, the teaching careers tended to be almost abandoned because of the low income of teaching. And in very recent years, uh, the government has 
uh, uh, granted uh, 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 teaching uh, uh, scholarships for uh, people uh, in order to foster the, uh, uh, the, the women ap applying into, into teaching careers because of the lack of professors and the need for better professors. Therefore, they are stimulating even uh, students that have the good averages in, in their marks in order to, for them to choose teaching by incentivizing better salaries. That is one thing. Now, the other thing is that you can also witness in Chile that women are, 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 are applying to uh, other careers, uh, scientific careers, etc., because there has also been a diversification in the working force. And that is very interesting. You can now see women that uh, uh, are doing jobs that were traditionally masculine. Like, for example, in the mining sector in the north of Chile, you can see women driving tractors and women uh, driving high, driving high, uh, machinery big trucks. Big trucks. Yeah, big trucks, maquinaria ma pesada. No, um, they obtain higher salaries, and there is no reason why they could not do that job. And I think that is a form of uh, integration that has been very, very positive for women into the working force. It's been a fascinating discussion, a great talk. And once again, let me thank you. Thank you. For thank you being very here much. With us and this I'm evening. sorry for my English. Sometimes I get very mixed Your up. Your English is fine. Thank you.